Does the police union president in Cleveland have a responsibility to the community he serves or just to the officers he represents? That's the subject of today's opinion show when we get together with members of the editorial board of The Plain Dealer and a Northeast Ohio Media Group for a discussion. I'm here today with opinion director Elizabeth Sullivan, deputy editorial page editor and columnist Kevin O'Brien, and editorial writers Chris Evans and Sharon Broussard. Chris, I'm going to start with you. Why are we talking about Steve Loomis, the police union president? Well, we're, we're talking about him because Steve made a, a very inflammatory uh, and irresponsible comment to, to a Northeast Ohio Media Group reporter uh, about the consent decree. He said that this is going to get uh, police officers killed. And, you know, that is not, that's just not an appropriate response to the, to the consent decree. I mean, this is, this whole thing is built on collaboration and cooperation. And for him to pick out uh, one aspect of this report, which has to do with the reporting of uh, the use of, of force and suggest that uh, police officers are going to hesitate because they're gonna be thinking about the paperwork that's gonna uh, result from them unholstering their gun. In this case, it would require them checking a box um, could result in the death of either a police officer or a civilian is it's it's just not appropriate. So it sets the stage a little bit. We have this consent decree, which mm -hmm. which is supposed to be the blueprint for improving the community's relationship with the police department mm -hmm. after a, a decades of, of dysfunction. Mm -hmm. um, a whole lot of people are looking to this as as a big answer to that problem and right out of the chute you have the guy who leads the police saying I hate this it's going to get officers killed how do you think that plays in the neighborhoods where people have hope for this well you know obviously it it undercuts the expectation of change that this consent decree has engendered and that the mayor's strong support for the consent decree should engender uh, and the police were consulted and their uh, concerns and and needs were reflected in the extensive recommendations, 105 pages worth, uh, not simply recommendations anymore, but mandates that are in this consent decree. I actually think that Steve Loomis is playing this really ridiculous and dangerous double game where he's trying to kind of, you know, he, he was elected because he's a big mouth, right? I, I, maybe that's a, a slightly overstatement, but you know, the, the rank and file like the fact that he's outspoken. But you know, the, he needs to also represent their interests in concluding this consent decree in a way most favorable to you know, the police force and its training, its preparation, its community relations, so that you know, that will enhance the safety of officers and not the reverse. Right. His job, though, is to represent the officers and, and protect the officers' rights and to make sure that they're, they're well cared for in this agreement. Does he have a responsibility to the community to try and make this consent decree work, or is his responsibility to try and make sure it is as favorable as possible to the police? Well, you know, that if I were gonna answer that, I'd know your opinion. <laughs> I would say that his, he has a fiduciary responsibility to his officers that he represents, but that that fiduciary responsibility also encompasses paying attention to how the community feels about the police and what kind of relationship you have. The better the relationship, the safer the police officers will be. The better trained the police officers, the safer they will be as well as the community. I mean, one of the th issues underlying the uh, police chase and the 137 shots fought, fired is that the police officers were essentially shooting from diff both sides of the vehicle. They could have easily been shot one, one another. Their safety is also at issue here. Right. With and, better training and the thing with Loomis is that, uh, I mean, there's like two Loomises. There's the public Loomis who gets up on a soapbox and makes um, these irresponsible and inflammatory statements. And then there's the Steve Loomis who, since December, has been hosting community meetings uh, where civilians are coming in, residents are coming in, and he's talking to them about their concerns. Well, and you talked to the private Loomis yesterday right. in uh, preparation yeah. for the editorial, yes. and he didn't have quite the level of bombast that he had when he talked to the reporter uh, with you. He seemed like he was more reasonable. Well, he, he is. I mean, he is um, 
I mean, he's an effective leader. I mean, he's outspoken and, and he, he's aggressive and he's in your face, when, particularly if there's a television camera around. But at the same time, he's a smart guy. And, and he believes he has a good relationship with the mayor. He understands that the consent decree has uh, a lot of potential for the officers that he represents in terms of improved equipment, improved safety, better training. Um, and he told me, and, and, and I believe he was sincere, that, you know, I mean, they're not that far apart ideologically, the community and the police that he represents. They all want safe neighborhoods. They don't want anybody but ever. He, but he did not pull back from his comment about no. getting officers killed, and that's something I think you agree with. Right. I don't think you can discount the possibility that he's absolutely right. Uh, mm -hmm. in addition to being inappropriate. I mean, what, are, what is an inappropriate comment on an editorial board? Come on, guys. If you've got a comment, make it. Um, I, think that the, I think he's right in that when he said, we especially, he said that particularly younger officers or less experienced officers might be reluctant to draw their weapon if they need to, and, and you know, the briefest hesitation could be too late. Mm -hmm. I would uh, expand on that a little bit. I think he's right about that. And I would expand on that a little bit and say that older officers are going to find a way to get themselves out of places where a scrape is likely to occur so that they can avoid the situation altogether, which certainly doesn't serve the interests of the neighborhoods. Right, I got to bring this up because it hasn't appeared yet, but we've been doing a lot of work, one of our reporters on Cincinnati, which has had a consent decree from, since uh, 2000, uh, and things have worked famously. Everybody says it's a, a much better relationship. Um, that reporter, Corey Schaefer, talked to officers there and they say they've seen no hesitance to, to draw their guns, that nobody is allowing that paperwork issue to be a factor there. So just... Yeah, you, you won't see hesitation that you don't know about. I mean, there's no statistical way to see that. Well, you, you may go at, to anecdotally, but I don't I was, believe that that's true. I when think I was that talking the, the, to they will hesitate because they're thinking about their right. career at the same time they're thinking about right. the and, situation and they're in. Steve Loomis makes a compelling argument for that. And I think <coughs> it's a legitimate issue, but it's an issue that needs to be addressed in the appropriate forum. And that's not on a soapbox talking to the public when, when what you're trying to do is reassure the community that you are working towards best practices, not just for the police officers, but for the residents they protect. And, and I heard and read that comment and thought, this actually speaks to something completely different, to a failure to adequately train young police exactly. officers uh, when they're coming in so that there isn't that kind of hesitance. And that's fundamental, and it, you know, it shouldn't even be an issue in a case like this. Right, or and that's the, that's the irony of Loomis, because he recognizes that. But that part of the issue here is, is this is not, uh, the, the idea that the paperwork would be an issue or that they're going to get second guessed being an issue comes down to fear of discipline. And a big part of this consent decree is to build an early warning system uh, to detect officers before they get into an area where they might need discipline. So if, if an analysis shows that an officer hits a threshold of, of drawing his weapon more than would be expected, they can bring that officer in, do some extra training to make sure that they understand when it's appropriate to draw guns. Yeah, I was about to say that data is actually, you know, helpful for, helpful for them. And every single industry and business around here recognizes that, you know, that the more data you collect, the better you could see patterns of, of practices that uh, may not be all that good and that should be changed. But you don't know that without the data. And you kind of can understand the cops saying, we've never had to do this before. And all of a sudden, every time we do anything of note, you guys want us to document it. But that is part of the real world these days. And that is part of how you could use data to improve the situation. And, and actually, it will be beneficial, but it could be a hard slog at first. Right, but I think that's where you know, it's an issue that you bring up at the table. I mean, mm -hmm. the judge hasn't reviewed this document. He hasn't approved it. It's still a work in progress. If, if the concerns that, that Loomis has about the chilling effect of some of these new uh, oversight measures will, will have on officers, you know, he should bring it up and they should talk about it and, and address those concerns. Well, here's another issue too. We had a story today about the, uh, the likely cost of this. Yes. I think that when somebody like Steve Loomis gets up and starts spewing negativity, it will discourage the 
funders that the city is going to rely on to pony up money, foundations, charities, uh, and you know other other ent and businesses, not simply relying on the taxpayers of the city of Cleveland. Yeah. Uh, and that is, I think, really a serious consideration. Certainly, the police want to be have their department better funded for better equipment, better training, better salaries. Mm -hmm. More more policemen. I think more they're pretty police. understaffed, yeah. and right. they'd love to see that change. Right. But I don't think you can you can fairly accuse somebody of pointing out the negatives of this thing publicly of doing something wrong. I mean, that's well, no, I don't think yes, there's, there's a sales pitch going on here, but there's a downside to it too, and but, people but ought to know what it is. But there's ways to do where that, Kevin. Yeah. I think where the language when when you when you say that this is a this document is going to get a police officer killed, you know. I think you can phrase it a little differently. The, the you other know, thing is, training why? on what why Betsy would you? said, the, there is, the, now that the consent Say decree is there, you're calling on people to, to trust it a little bit. You need the community to say, okay, we're going to lower our guard here and try and work with the police, the philanthropic community. You are trying to build a community consensus, and that kind of incendiary language does get in the way. Of that. It's very yeah, easy to say from up here on Mount Olympus. We're right. not out there with our, our badge on trying to keep the peace in neighborhoods that don't particularly like us. But you're right. also not in the neighborhoods where people feel the police are not their friend. That's either. what I just said. But, but those are the people that you need to appeal to. And if you have the leader of the police swinging away saying, this isn't going to work, it's going to get cops killed, we don't want to do it. What do you think the chances are that the community there, there is a respond? very large and active political force out there that's going to tell these people not to trust the agreement anyway. So I'm not sure you're losing anything. But, right. but what's very, uh, I think, telling here is that Steve Loomis says one thing when the cameras are rolling, and he says completely, you know, different or very differently phrased and differently, uh, the atmospherics of it are completely different. So that the really um, you know, incendiary language is saved for public occasions. And really, it is almost like, you know, the two Steve Lewises. And it does undercut this idea that it's all being driven by legitimate it's, it's well, all and Kevin I'd leadership, also right? I mean, if, if you really are a community leader, and he holds himself out to be that, what's the best thing for the community? What, what, what is the best way to get this community to a place where the police and the neighborhoods and everybody else are working together. Is what he did the best way to do that, or is what Chris is suggesting, where he sits down at the table and works with people the best way to do it? What's the, what's the best collaboration here? I don't see him not sitting down at the table and doing whatever right. it is that you want him to do, but I think being honest is a really good no, idea. I, and I and agree, the honest Kevin. The fact and I, is, and this is very likely to put police officers at risk I that they weren't at before. I think that's a totally legitimate issue. I really do, and I agree with him. And we, that the last thing we want is for a police officer to get shot or a civilian. And, um, you know, Loomis lives in the city. I mean, he lives here, his kids go to school here. I mean, he is a stakeholder, not just as the head of the largest police union in the city, but as a resident. And, you know, to me, you know, there's common ground there. I want That's to get back to the, the statistic thing because I didn't get a chance to, to answer that. If you're a policeman and you're out doing your job and you're living or you're working under a system that is second guessing everything you do, or at least it feels that way, your next step is if, you, if you're going to draw your weapon, you have to check a box. And this may, we make this sound like it's a really easy thing to do. But you know you've got a finite number of box checks before they bring you in. Well, Are you going to be up. eager to go through? whatever it is that they have planned for you, no matter how gentle it may be. Is that something you're going to want to do? No. So what are you going to do? You're either not going to check the box, or you're going to avoid the situation that, you might, that might lead you to check the box, or you're going to get out. But you're painting a combative situation. You're painting the situation as it's the officers versus their supervisors in that. And that's not what it is. It's designed to get them to work together, to let the officers know we got your back, and before you get into danger, we want to work with you. And that's the way it's worked in Cincinnati. Nobody, the police union in Cincinnati was dead set against the consent decree when it started. Now they're one of its biggest advocates. 
that once you get the officers to believe this is not about getting you, it's about making your life better and there's some trust there, it's not that hard to check the box because they know that if th this is intended to help me. Take a but walk I in think, Clifton after dark. Well, Go to Cincinnati take and take a walk in Clifton after but, dark. But I think it's, it's also, we've got to look at the context of this and I think we've just had the Brelo trial and I think there's concern um, among members of the police department that you know you've got this Tim McGinty you've got this county prosecutor who um, you know wants to go after the police he wants to go after police officers and the concern is that he will use data that's being collected under the consent decree to do that so the point that Kevin made you know and, and Loomis makes this too okay so Loomis gets involved in a police shooting two years down the road well, we pull his record. We make a public records request. We see that there are 115 incidents of use of force. And now maybe they're all level one, which means all he did was unholster his weapon. But we see a pattern there. And it's like, well. Or you see a pattern where it's the third time he's done it and he doesn't have a history of right. doing I'm that. just saying the that. The data protects the officers if they're doing what they're supposed to do as much as it works against them if they're not. Right. That having, you're, what you're suggesting is we're better off not having the data. No, I'm just Are you saying what, channeling what, I'm him? channeling okay. Okay. Oh, I'm sure. I'm That's saying, what you're doing. But I mean, the nice that, or the public The, the <laughs> nice one, yeah, the, the, the smart one. Um, I'm just saying this feeds, you know, the credibility works both ways. It's, it's establishing credibility within the community, but it's also establishing credibility within the police department. Right. And I think that Loomis feels that his membership has a legitimate concern over how this data would be used by someone like a McGinty, who they see as, as a guy who wants to go after cops. Well, this gives a good window on what the city needs to do to bring the police along and make them a part. They have the to. I mean, there's... He's the head of the largest police union in the city. I mean, it's not going to work without his cooperation. That's all of our time. Clearly, we don't agree on this. And if you don't agree with anything that's been said here, please leave your comment in the post where you see this show. We'll see you next time. That's hard to believe. What?